Maybe you haven't, because it's a little before your time. Now, that's kind of a layered patch, but um, it uses a component that was like mega ultra popular back in the day. Everyone used it on everything. There are a number of patches in the DX7 that are known as like signature patches that everyone used. Um, very overused. But you see all these buttons up here? The, these and a couple of the buttons over here and this slider are all you have to program the thing. On your analog, since you have knobs all over the place and you have all kinds of uh, switches and, and dials that you can flip around and, and do stuff with, and for, for your average musician who's not really a, a computer scientist or a programmer, um, having those knobs is kind of intuitive. You get down with the sound and you really feel like you're, you're accomplishing something, just twisting things. Screwing around with this little dial and pressing a bunch of buttons, which by the way are like gum rubber, so they're, they take a toll on your fingers after a while. Um, and, and then all these little things up here, I'll explain them in a minute, but uh, they all change stuff. And it's such a vast alien landscape that no synthesis at the time really wanted to mess with it. So an entire industry of, uh, of nerds like us uh, popped up and started offering their services as programmers for these things. Um, so all right, you have the, the GS1, which was this massive wooden monstrosity um, that cost like $10,000 or something, uh, comes up. And then they, they consumerize it into the DX7. And then you have the TX816, which is this rack unit, which you can put little modules in. And each one is like a complete DX7 in a little thing. So the trend towards mini miniaturization uh, definitely popped up in the synthesis world uh, to the point where you have a little plug-in card, the PLG-150s, who can actually slide into various Yamaha synths and workstations that are popular uh, today. Actually, the latest Yamaha synth doesn't support these plug-in the cards, and everyone is pissed off because they want their DX7. Um, all right, so various things happen in, in the timeline. Um, and then the sceners come in, and uh, the demo scene completely embraces the ad lib, though not to the degree of mod tracking, which is probably another seminar. Um, and all kinds of cool programs come up to, to edit it, to, um, to track with it, to, to make you know, music using FM. And, uh, and then some commercial games used, uh, had ad-lib support, uh, you know, like this little insignificant one down here. <laughs> George, are you there? <laughs> all right. You're hearing the Nintendo. You all know the Nintendo. This is Castlevania, in case anyone doesn't know. And if you don't, uh, just don't ask, don't tell. All right? All right. So to do synthesis on the Nintendo, uh, it's just a pulse wave, which is basically on and off. And you turn it on and off fast enough, it's going to go blip, 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 and then you have a beep. That's essentially what it is. Um, you can have square waves, which are equal on and off, or you can have pulse waves uh, with varying duty cycles, which are some on and a whole bunch off, or vice versa. Um, but anyway, it's a very easy thing to synthesize. Um, and it was, you know, it's like the obvious first, first choice for the, the original game systems, because it was cheap and easy to do. Now you have FM. Here it sounds totally different. It sounds way, way thicker. And you can hear each of the individual sounds has its own uh, has its own character to it. You know, they're they're not just just blips and bleeps. As much as I love blips and bleeps, um, this goes a little bit beyond that, and it's uh, it's just a neat sound. Um, now I'm gonna skip by the equations, and you can you can just research them on your own. Um, because I'm not smart enough to explain them. Uh, just remember this, FM is very, very, very fast vibrato, and vibrato is just wiggling. Um, so you, you, I mean, I'll, whoa, 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 whoa that's vibrato. Uh, when you wiggle a, a sound in, 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 in space time, uh, you, get, uh, you get an effect known as vibrato. Um, and the vibrato gets so fast that interesting things start to happen as, as you speed it up. Um, due to the, the combination of the hardware and our ears and our brains, we start to perceive sideband frequencies. And that leads to something cool called timbre. And timbre, uh, it distinguishes a piano from a guitar, uh, from a human voice. 
Now, uh, the volume also affects that perception. You know, if it starts out high and then fades out, but more, more to the actual character of the sound, um, the timbre will, will tell you what you're listening to. Um, and you can hear the difference in, uh, in different types of instruments. All right, so anyway, when you pluck a guitar string, I'm just going to give you a basic overview here in case anybody's not familiar with how vibration works. I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> when you pluck a guitar string, it vibrates a certain number of times per second and vibrates also along its length at near integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. The fundamental frequency is how fast the main string is vibrating. But then you also get all these little mini vibrations along, along the length. I um, can't believe I just said that. And, uh, <laughs> And because it, the guitar string is, is much longer than it is thick, you get uh, multiples that are, that are kind of like two, three, four, and so on. And each one of those things creates a little spike in the frequency. Um, and you perceive that as, as the character of the sound. Um, and each one of these, you know, it, it kind of like waterfalls and triggers. And your brain, being as simple as it is, doesn't hear these vibrations separately. It, it, it hears it as a single sound, even though you're hearing you know, something down here and something down here and something way, way up high. Um, you only hear that one sound altogether because it's, it's playing at the same time and coming from the same location, things like that. So with a guitar string, it's, it's fairly even multiples, not necessarily even, but uh, integer multiples. So you, have, you won't have like 1.5 time um, the, the fundamental frequency in the overtone. Am I going too fast? Does anybody want um, clarification on anything thus far? OK, cool. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to judge you much. No, seriously. This is, uh, this is something I'm only still struggling to understand. And through explaining it, I'm, I'm getting a better grasp on it. Um, so in a guitar string, you have these the, the um, integer multiples of the frequency. And so it's a pure sound. It sounds good to our ears. We like, we like multiples. We like even multiples. Um, so, so when you hear the, the guitar pluck, it sounds consonant. It sounds nice. Now, let's see. Yeah, the harmonic series is the is the the series of even multiples of the sound um, that sound good to us. Now, that that's not always the case. When you hit a cymbal, it's going to go, and the reason it goes and not, which some cymbals do, is because the order goes out the window, and we have, we have all kinds of vibrations all over the surface of the cymbal. And they're, they're definitely not even. They're not, they're not uh, it's not like one times, two times, three times. Um, you get stuff all over the spectrum. And because of that, our, our ears perceive it as noise. And that's a good thing in some cases. If you have you know, chimes and things like that, Tibetan singing bowls. Um, so so we, need, we need that kind of stuff as well. But instrument sounds that we recognize as melodic tend to be uh, even multiples. So, yeah, get to the point already. So when you, when you wiggle a simple waveform like a sine wave, do we know what a sine wave is? Just a basic up and down curve. Um, when you wiggle that around a, a whole lot, you're going to hear all these frequencies kind of blend together into a single sound, which is a very curious thing. Um, and that's what, that's what Dr. Shannon discovered um, and patented and, let's see. And so when, when this happens, you get, you get timbre. It, it creates the, the uh, characteristic sound of instruments. And by controlling which uh, sideband frequencies uh, are incorporated into the sound, you can control what kind of timbre you have. Uh, so instead of hearing a spastically oscillating sine wave, we hear satch. Joke's on us. Yeah. All right, here's some visual aids. Now, an interesting thing happens. Well, I'm going to first vibrate it real fast so you can see it going all over the place. Now we're slowing it down to a very simple oscillation. Now, I'm going to speed it up. And I'm going to continue speeding it up every so often. So you can actually listen to when it makes that transformation. You see the waveform starting to take shape there? It's no longer just a sine wave going back and forth, it's a complete sound.
and now we take away the vibration, and it's just a simple sine wave. And then we put it back. Now it's a complete sound. That is FM in its most basic form. Now all those little spikes that you saw there, those are sidebands. Um, and it's, it's still not actually a concrete waveform, you know, a, a single sound. Do it again. <laughs> all right, I'll do it again. Actually, I have more visual aids coming up, so you'll get to see those. I'll run out of time if I go back and forth on these things. All right, so I'm just going to do a very, very simple sweep from no modulation to full modulation. You see what just happened there is all of these little sideband frequencies pop up all over. And as you can see, they get exponentially more uh, close together as the, as the frequency curve goes up. That's just because of my graph there, anyway. Um, so the upshot of this is that all of these things come basically out of nowhere because you're just modulating the single simple sine wave over a, a very wide range. Um, and our ears hear that as, as character. You notice the, the sound got a whole lot brighter as, as, I, as I went over the sweep. Now I'm going to give you a more complex sweep so you can actually follow it around and see what it looks like as it goes. It's like right here. So you guys got a, a basic idea of, of what's going on here is, is as the sine wave modulates more, you, you just get more character. <laughs> I can speed it up. All right, so anyway, this, this was applied to not only the, D, the DX7 keyboard that you heard earlier, but a whole bunch of uh, chips that were put into, you know, it was miniaturized to the point where you can put an entire synth on just a single chip. Um, and that's exactly what they did, and they jammed them in a whole bunch of different computers. Uh, the Japanese were nuts about, about FM synthesis, and they put them in everything. Um, so we, had, we have the, the 2151 is, uh, is what you're going to see a whole lot in, in arcade games. If you go into an arcade game, you ever play, like, I think Smash TV? Um, basically, like, half of the arcade games produced up until 720. 720, yeah. All those things will, will have uh, either the 2151 or the 2203, which is in our next little page here. Um, and here's what they sound like. This is Splatterhouse, an arcade game. You hear it's got a really thick, spooky kind of sound. have kind of an idea of what FM really really sounds like now. Um, there are more, more famous chips around here. The 2203 is, is lots and lots and lots of arcade games all over the place. The PC-8801 and the 9801 are old Japanese computers, as is the MSX that we saw on the last page, which is not entirely true because they had them in Europe too. Anyway, the Neo Geo had a combination of FM and, um, and PCM, which is samples. So it could use samples and uh, and FM synthesis at the same time, which made for some really interesting sounds, and I'll show you what that sounds like later. Uh, and then the old Genesis used the 2612, which is, you know, they had little friendly names for them down here. And the 2612 had um, not only FM, but it had uh, square waves like the, the, like the Nintendo, and, uh, and noise, and PCM. It had a whole bunch of stuff. This is, I think, coming from the PC-9801. And then this is coming from the Genesis. This is Streets of Rage 2, which is one of the better examples of programming you'll ever hear on the Genesis. I wish you guys could hear the bass, because it's like, it's incredible. All right, now they started putting them in, in, uh, in Western computers as well uh, as add-in cards. If anybody ever had an ad lib or a sound blaster, show of hands. Oh, yeah! So you guys have all heard this stuff. Uh, if you played a game any time in the 90s, you probably heard this stuff. 
uh, the ad lib and the sound blaster used the OPL2, which was at the time a revolution in, in size and, and cost. Um, and then the SP16 and the Pro, the OPL3 effectively doubled the capacity. Um, so you could fit all kinds of, of voices in there. Uh, I think you could do up to 18 on the OPL3. Um, and 18 voices of FM at once is a massive wall of sound. So the thing could do pretty much everything you wanted. And then the MSX Moon Sound uh, had the same <laughs> capabilities, but it added PCM, so you could use samples in it too, which was like, if you were around at the time, which I was not, <clears throat> it must have been an absolute thrill to, to get this thing for the first time and be able to, to use it. I just, oh. This is Metal of Vibrance, and, uh, and he's one of the best at this stuff. In fact, if you go to vibrance.dk, is it? Yeah, I think. Um, they're some of the best guys at AdLib at ad -lib Music, and they have a bunch of it on their site for free. So if you want to listen to the stuff, that's where you want to go. And then this is me, so. on an OPL3. All right, enough. Um, and as you can hear, that OPL3 really opens up a, a world of sound. I mean, you get crazy amounts of uh, complexity in there. You can do layering and things like that. So show of hands, who's the, at least the, the least bit interested in making some stuff like this? Come on, everyone. Yeah, that's what I was, that's what I was hoping for. All right, so the good news is you can do this all for free. Uh, you can download everything you need to do to do everything you just heard. Um, and a lot of the times it's really well documented, and some of the times the documentation is either missing or in Japanese. So you might have to wing it sometimes, but uh, to get started and to learn the stuff, there's so much information out there, because this is a very uh, mature uh, form of synthesis. And so usually you're going to get around six to eight voices of polyphony, which is six to eight, six to eight instruments at one time, uh, playing one note each. Or one note, one instrument playing eight voices at once. You get the picture. Um, the DX7 has up to 16, and then the OPL3 has up to 18. So there are certain sounds that FM is really good for and certain sounds that it's terrible for, and most of them fall somewhere in between. Um, if you're doing bells or electric pianos, you really can't beat FM for that kind of stuff, unless you really want to get additive, and that's a different seminar. So yeah, cutting edge tools. Uh, this is the latest and greatest. Um, actually, it's not, but... Um, Way back when, when all the pointy-headed nerds were, uh, were taking over the programming industry, they made editors. And these editors, th these are the same little trees that you saw on top of the DX7, if you remember. Um, and those are, those are known as algorithms. And each one of those is a layout of operators, which I'm going to tell you about in just a second. Um, but these made it very, very easy to edit even the monstrosity uh, DX7s and TX8-16s and things like that. So these days, you don't have to worry about any of those little editors and things and getting stuff running on Ataris, um, although you might want to do that just to get the, uh, the, the authentic feeling. But FM soft synths these days are, are awesome. And lots of them are free. And they're available as plugins for your sequencer, if you use uh, Cubase or Sonar or anything like that, um, or Logic. And you can just plug them into your sequ uh, sequencer and, and rock with them. Um, and the best part is you're not dealing with hardware and you're not dealing with expensive hardware. So as long as it can be programmed into a computer algorithm, uh, you can put it in your, your FM synth. So things like filters, things like distortion, um, you know, outboard effects, reverb, all these things are possible now with FM soft synths that you could never even dream of on you know, a DX7. Um, although you could fake it to a big degree, and I'll talk about that later. Anyway, that's something I've noticed. Blue is like the official color of... Uh, of FM. Yeah, FM7 actually approximates the look of the DX7, so that's, that's the one I like to use. All right, now, show of hands, who's tracked here? All right, awesome. So we have all the trackers are over here. Uh, it's be a right brain thing. Anyway, you have all kinds of awesome trackers that you can use, um, and my particular favorite is this one. It's FM Track 3R, um, uh, AdLib Track 3R by Sub Z3 Row. Sub-Zero's uh, AdLib Tracker 2, um, it will run on modern computers and stuff, so all you need to do is find a, a machine old enough to have an ISA slot, and drop a sound blaster in there, and you're good to go. 
Um, and here's Scream Tracker over here, which was a sample-based tracker that also had ad-lib support, which was awesome for its time. Um, although the FM interface is kind of, mm, but it works. And uh, all right, so we're going to get into the meat of, of what actually makes FM work. Now, the most important concept you're going you're gonna to take out of this is the operator. Um, an operator is just a waveform with optionally a volume envelope on it. Almost always it has a volume envelope. Does anyone not know what an envelope is? OK, an envelope is a curve that determines how, f how loud a sound will be over time. So it has an attack, decay, sustain, and release in, in most cases. And the attack is the beginning part where it ramps up to the full volume. The decay is when it goes down to the holding volume, which is when you hold the key. And then the release is after you let off the key, it'll fade out slowly or fast, depending on how you set it. So an operator is an envelope on top of a waveform. And uh, most of the times, it's just a sine wave. But uh, you know, on, on the later synths, I think TX81Z could use multiple waveforms. Um, you can use square waves. You can use pulse waves, sine waves. And in some, you can even use uh, white noise as, as you know. You can, you can basically modulate any waveform um, in modern synths that you want. Most of the time, you're going to have two operators working together. Um, and that's the carrier and the modulator, which are two different types of operators. Uh, and one operates on the other one. But that's not the rule. You can always chain them together. You know, all these uh, different diagrams that I showed you before, these are all the ways you can link the operators together. So each one of these boxes is an operator, and the lines connecting them determine signal flow. And sometimes they're in series, and they just garble each other up. Or you have these ones, which are feedback loops, Things like that. OK. All right, so the carrier is the basic waveform that you start with. Um, and uh, like I just said it, you can use anything as, as a carrier these days. Now, the modulator is where the fun happens. Uh, the carrier gets wiggled around really, really fast by the modulator. That's the thing that does the wiggling. Um, and that's what, what creates all these sidebands and partials and things. How am I doing on time? OK, good. And usually, to get a, a pleasant sound, like, like I talked about before with the guitars, how it's in even multiples and things like that, you'll usually set it to a ratio with an in integer. And I think by default, some older synths, you can't do anything other than you know, on a set list of 2 to 1, 4 to 1, 8, eight to 1, things like that. Um, let's see. Yeah, you, you can still get around that, and you can get partials everywhere. Yeah, th this, this is like the intermission where I tell you that this is not actually FM I'm talking about. It's phase modulation, PM, which is a much stabler form because you're actually adding the modulation to the waveform uh, right after the, the phase integration. Um, and what that means is essentially it won't go out of tune over time. Because FM synthesis basically. Uh, it starts the waveform off wherever it happens to be at the time. So you can get, you can get stuff that's out of phase and things like that. Yamaha implemented um, phase modulation in all of their synths. So if you use a DX7 or something, you can call it FM and nobody's going like, to beat you up or anything. For all intents and purposes, it is frequency modulation. It's the same, same sound. All right, so here's a brass ensemble sound. Some keyboarding seals. Uh, that, that basically, I had I had diagrams showing how the modulation things were, but they didn't copy over onto onto uh, this presentation when I removed my computer from the network because I'm stupid. Uh, anyway, malice and chimes. We create all kinds of cool stuff this way. We have yeah. Thank you, Cleveland! All right. Um, <laughs> shit. Whoops. Strings. They're not realistic, but I mean, having this kind of uh, latitude in the 80s when all you had was these knob twirly analog synths, not that there's anything wrong with that, uh, was, was an amazing thing to, uh, to, to, to have because you could suddenly get this 
huge palette of, uh, of sound. So yeah, basically, unless you're a math whiz, you're not going to be able to plan out exactly how you want things to sound and then say, OK, I will set this ratio to this and this ratio to this. You're probably just going to mess around, just like twiddling knobs, which is why the, uh, the DX7 was so abysmal for early programmers. Um, so basically, experimentation rules. Um, in, the, in FM7 and other soft synths, you actually have a randomized control, which is, is, is a lot of fun, because you can just click that and get all kinds of crazy stuff. And every now and then, you'll actually get a perfectly realistic trumpet. <laughs> Infinite monkeys. Um, <laughs> Infinite trumpets, trumpeting monkeys. So yeah, but that doesn't mean you have to go into it completely random. You can still say, I want to have this, you know, you have most control over the volume, um, because you can always set your envelopes and, and know where they're at. It's just what happens with the timbre when you adjust uh, the modulation amounts and things like that. That's kind of unpredictable. Um, and you have to try it and then play a couple notes and you know, test it out. Um, but yeah, there, there are still tricks you can use. Uh, and probably the most popular one to use is the component model, meaning that when you make a sound, you're going to have one, one thing that serves as either the beginning or the middle part of the sound, and the other one's going to fill in the rest. So you don't have to have the trumpet going <clears throat> and at the same time, you can separate them and then combine them and have one play at the beginning and then the rest play afterwards. And in fact, the Roland D50 uh, was a synth that capitalized on that by using samples of actual instrument waveforms just for the very beginning of the sound and then a very simple waveform loop afterwards. So it took almost no memory, but you still got the characteristic of the sound because of that attack, which is the beginning part of the sound. So the component model is, is pretty popular. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of it. Here's a chiffy flute. You hear that the chiff at the beginning of it? There you go. Here's just the chiff. And then here's just the sustain part. Either one of those on its own sounds terrible, but you combine them and you get cool stuff. And you can even adjust the volume uh, envelopes to make it more realistic. Like that's the beginning, and the, you hear it sounds meter now, it has some sustain in it. And <laughs> so yeah, uh, almost all instruments can, can, can benefit from this. You can make all kinds of cool sounds that way. Um, and that's not the end. You can always chain stuff together and have other stuff modulating <laughs> other stuff, and you, you have all kinds of interesting feedback loops. That's when it really gets unpredictable. Um, because you, know, you can modulate one by another, and by another, and by another, and you, you wiggle each one around by the previous one. Uh, you wiggle each one wiggles around the previous one, and you get all kinds of interesting effects. Um, you can do evolving pads. You can do really crunchy, distorted stuff. And that's how I said you can get around the limitations of effects. You can simulate filter sweeps. You can, uh, you can simulate guitar amps. Basically, by, by having variable amounts of feedback and unpredictability, otherwise known as noise, you can, uh, you can really do some cool stuff. Yeah, and by the way, speaking of filters, you didn't get them because uh, that, was, that was all about the analog stuff at the time. And FM just, you know, the guys just didn't, didn't put anything in like that. But as I demonstrated with the sweep, you're getting a whole big wrap, wrap up kind of thing. So you can definitely simulate the sound, um, but you're not going to do like a perfect TB303 impression on, a, on an FM synth. And because I said that, one of y'all is going to go home and do it. <laughs> that's, what, that's what happens when you, all right, let's see. It's kind of a filter. It's not, doesn't really, it achieves the same effect. So yeah, like I said, the best, the best thing about this is that you can switch your, uh, your routing and get all kinds of cool stuff happening at once. Um, do, 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 do. And yeah, for drum sounds, you can, uh, you, can, you can set certain synths to have a white noise component. In other words, just a shh as a, as a, as a carrier or a modulator or both. And, or, or you can just change the channel over to noise. And, and you can do drums that way. Because as I'm about to tell you, drums don't really work too well in FM most of the time. And now, before you, you rush the stage, um, that's not always true. You can get some interesting drum sounds. Uh, it's just that it's not really, it's kind of convoluted and you really have to mess with the sound before you'll get anything resembling, you know, a snare drum. Um, in the old Sound Blaster uh, default general MIDI set, the, the 
drum sound was just like <laughs> it was terrible. It didn't sound anything like a snare drum. So eh, eh. hook up a drum synth and just be done with it. But if you're if you're writing stuff that's just you know self-contained FM like an ad lib track, uh, you're gonna have to really work on those drums because it's it's kind of tough. Luckily, there are thousands and thousands of presets that people have made over the years, and a lot of the ones from one synth will work on the other ones because they have the same basic structure. Especially if you're working on Yamaha synths, they did a lot of backwards compatibility, so you can load up like an FB1 patch on a TX81, things like that, or on VOPM or FM7, which are the soft synths that I talked about. All right. So anyway, this is a very complex subject, as you know as I've kind of hinted at. Um, so I, on my website, I have put up a large amount of links that you, can, that you can go to. And some of them are like academic papers that are way over, way over lots of people's heads, including mine. Um, some of them are how to program stuff in, in actual code. Um, there's, there's one site that I haven't put on there yet, which I will, that is just a site where they, it's a huge repository of code snippets for, for generating various types of sounds, and they have some FM examples there as well. Um, there's another one that illustrates the example between frequency and phase modulation. Identical though it sounds, it's still produced in a different way, and they'll, they'll explain that. And then I also have like sound on sound uh, tutorials and various other uh, tutorial and educational links that will actually walk you through creating patches on, on certain synths or in general. And, uh, but yeah, I can't, I can't compile it myself. Uh, entirely, because there's always going to be something I miss. So if you guys go there and you look through it and you see something that's not on there, please let me know, because I want to try to build up a resource of, uh, of FM links so that people who are just getting into this stuff can actually browse there and you know see what's up. All right, that's all I have. How am I on time? 12.46. OK, questions? Is there anything new being done uh, with hardware-based FM? I think I th there's, there's de the, the short answer is yes, there's, there's always stuff being done. Um, I don't know what the state of the art is currently. Um, the last big new FM synth that I know of that came out were uh, Yamaha put out a bunch of stuff in the early 2000s and late 90s. Um, the FS1R is, is a rack mount synth um, that basically is a full DX7 with all kinds of format stuff as well. It's, it's, really, it's really awesome. Um, and then the DX200 came out. Uh, I think, is there a groove box that does FM that just came out? Short answer is yes, there's new hardware stuff, um, modern stuff that, that will do FM synthesis. And most synth hardware synths that come out allow you to cross modulate. So you can do FM either way, even if they're not specialty uh, FM synths. Anyone else? What, what is current back, back here. Let's go back here. Oh. I just want to see the URL more. Okay. Oh, sorry. There we go. It's not linked externally yet, but I'll put it on my main website, vert.vgmix.com. So if you forget it, you can just browse there, and I'll, I'll throw it up there. OK. I, I just wondered what current technology, like keyboard technology, uses that's not FM anymore? That not? That isn't FM. What do they use uh, oh, as opposed to FM? These days, most synths, synths that you'll buy on the market today are in one of two categories. They're either virtual analog, which simulates the old knob twisty filtering subtractive synthesis, or they are um, sample-based. And the majority of the big workstations are all sample-based. Um, but then you get your specialty guys, like your viruses and your uh, you know, JPs and things like that, that, that will do analog synthesis. Um, but yeah, there, there are always going to be a number of specialty synths out there that, that do things like additive or organ modeling or things like that. But mostly, you're dealing with samples these days, which is kind of depressing, because a lot of the samples are of FM synths of days past. But uh, for a lot of the modern synths, you can actually buy plug-in cards or uh, expansion algorithms that, that do FM specifically. So there's still love for them out there. Use the mic. The original ad lib was two operator, right? Yes. Uh, the flute example that you played, where there was the plosive and the sustain, is yeah. that possible with just two operators? It's not going to sound as, as good, but you can, but you can yeah. You could use a, a very high um, decay 
on the um, on the modulator, okay. and take it down to almost nothing for the flute component. Um, but yeah, it's going to be kind of winging it. Uh, the more uh, the more operators you have to throw at stuff, the the easier it's going to be. But yeah, you can you can wing it. You can do it. Uh, you can do it on OPL three, I think. Hmm. Well, on the two op mode, or four op. It's a four op mode. Yeah, yeah, four ops. See, four ops. There's no problem because you can devote two pairs, and you can have a chip and then a, a sustain. Um, but if you're working with two ops, you only have one component to work with, so you have to fake it with envelopes. Um, and doing extreme modulation values, and then just ha only having it for a second can give that initial kind of pop to the sound. Um, so, anyone? Can you play sunshine for the audience? Sunshine. Why? What? What? There's a way to end your talk. Jeez. I could play my uh, Neo Geo-ish track from Blipfest. No, 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 sunshine. I don't have that on here. You don't have that sunshine anymore. No. Yeah, I'll do I'll do the, the the space one. All right, before I before I uh, start playing, so yeah, it'll it'll be about time. Does anybody else have questions? Uh, some of the old like arcade games, like the mm -hmm. they had a wizards and they had that game with the wizards and it actually had audio in there. It said like the wizard is dead. Red but warrior needs food badly. Was that an FM synthesis or an actual no. record in the unit? That was uh that was a a PCM waveform that they were playing back. Um, it was it was a, a sample, basically. Um, actually, I don't know if it was PCM back then. They might have had all kinds of discrete stuff happening in there. But the short answer is it was a recording. Um, uh, FM can't really do vocal synthesis, although the FS1R that came out in, in what was it, 98, 99, has formants built in that approximate the, the sound of the human voice. And you can do all kinds of cool stuff with that. If you can't tell, I want one pretty badly. But I haven't gotten around to getting one yet. So anyone else? OK, here we go. Let me quit the hell out of here. If we're going to give you up. Come on, live. Please start up. <coughs> Initiating. Why we all had that conversation with it? Okay. Yes. <laughs> all right. I think I have blip. Load. OK, computer. Nice. I can't see shit. <laughs> Max 330 Mega Pro Gear Spec. You can't hear any bass. Ah! That's all you get. Uh, I could start it. I could start it off from here again. Anyway, that's what FM sounds like today. That's the current where it's at. 
And that, that, what we were just hearing was all done with free stuff. Um, in able, in, uh, well not, the sequencer wasn't free, but you can get free, free sequencers that load VSTIs. Um, but that was done with VOPM, which is one of the plugins since, that's out there for free, and it is incredible. Um, it actually emulates the YM2151, which is known as the OPM, and that's one of the, the popular Japanese uh, synth chips way back. So it does a fairly accurate emulation of that. And uh, so that's all I got, guys. Any other questions? Anyone? All right, visit my site. Go educate yourself and uh, send me what you make, because I want to hear it. And I'll give you tips and critiques and crush your dreams and whatever you want. <laughs> so thank you guys very much.